I'm looking at a lot of things going on in the in the U.S. and much of it is unfortunately um, just not that interesting. Uh, if you think about what's really interesting today and what's more creative, a lot of it is a rehash of what's old, and that involves something now even something like Marvel movies, Spider Man. That's all based on an old comic book, um, Superman, uh, Infinity War, The Gauntlet. All of that is being rehashed. And it's not just that. If you think about movies just in general, not just the Marvel Universe, not just the DC Universe, even the older movies um, had better dialogue. And so you have to sort of think about what it means to be an American today, um, post 9-11, uh, post, you know, or not just post, but in the middle of a rising China. And you look at history post World War II and you see so many different avenues. You see Australia, you know, in the corner there trying to figure out if it wants to be a part of, you know, a full partner in ASEAN, um, you know, while maintaining its ties to the Commonwealth, which would be, you know, the UK, Canada, um, and of course, within the intelligence agencies, um, you know, New Zealand and the US, all of which share information. And so you have so many different, you know, sort of competing forces, and all of them are coming to a head right now. And part of it is there's just a need for uh, better cooperation, something that the British Prime Minister and, Ch and Chancellor Gordon Brown pointed out, um, probably the earliest out of all the different Western politicians. Uh, but of course, no one listened to him. And no, it's not that people didn't want to hear him. And of course, no one listened to Osama bin Laden when he openly, you know, <laughs> he openly told a journalist that um, he was going to attack the United States. Um, and so we have this strange situation where a lot of intelligence work is actually based on public information. Um, you know, there's a book by Aggie, A-G-E-E, -E, called Inside the Company, the company being the CIA. And what he says is that, um, you know, ultimately 80% of the information that's published in intelligence reports uh, that ultimately makes, it, makes it its way up the chain is based on public information. The 20%, that's based on covert operations or uh, intelligence sharing between different countries and different agencies. And if you think about that, you think about all the billions of dollars that are spent on, you know, different operations, you start to realize that it's very important to have not just transparency, but also integrity within so many different, you know, interlinked departments, not just your school systems from primary all the way up to the university level, uh, not just your local governments, um, but not just your corporations. But, you know, simply the idea is that in intelligence involves information gathering. And because 80% of it is based on public information, um, it's actually not that difficult to predict the future on a macro level. And, you know, that doesn't mean you're going to be able to figure out, you know, the next Amazon. Uh, but if you think about digital platforms taking over, you're not going to know if it's going to be Microsoft or Amazon or Google. Um, but you at least will be able to figure out the future involves, you know, for example, the banking sector, um, you know, trying to become more global and more digital um, in order to compete with cryptocurrency. You can make that prediction, but you can't tell whether or not, you know, the next digital wallet um, or, the, or the most fluidly adaptable, um, sorry, adoptable, um, you know, digital wallet will belong to a Wells Fargo branch or a JP Morgan branch. And that's what makes it harder on the investment side. But if you're just sort of into information gathering and, and just trying to make sense of what's around you, you know, it's not, it's actually not that difficult. But again, if you think about what's happened in the past with all these competing powers, um, you know, you're looking at a future that belongs to Asia and Africa for many reasons. Um, first, let me point out that nobody really remembers any, any German authors or any German artists uh, in 1934, 1935, 1936, 1937, 1938. A lot of that is because military spending drove the German economy uh, to the point where even the Volkswagen, um, you know, that car was actually made by a war effort. And that's not unusual. Lots of things are made um, out of necessity. What's different, of course, is post-Vietnam, um, you know, where the United States, along with other powers, tried to prevent China from extending its influence. Um, and part of that, again, is just, you know, having Singapore being a former British colony. Uh, you know, part of that, again, is, is this sort of chess game uh, with the soldiers being used as pawns, um, you know, being involved in a geopolitical 
you know, sort of, you know, it's hard to find the right words to describe what's happened post-Vietnam because it's not based on morality, it's not based on justice, it's not based on freedom. It's based on competition and sort of trying to figure out a way to prevent your competitor from going into a space and then setting up shop in order to inject its own banking system, its own insurance system, its own infrastructure companies, um, its own all that stuff, right? Um, and if you, if you think about that, the idea being if, 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 is that you know, it, it used to be called domino theory, but nobody really understands what that means. What it means is if there's an open space and you let somebody else get there first, it's just like a soccer game or a basketball game. They have a better position than you in the future and forever. And ultimately, if they're big enough, you can't go to war. You can't sort of knock them out um, physically. You have to compete economically. And sometimes that gets really, well, that does get expensive if somebody is already sitting there versus having an open spot. So in other words, if, if, you know, China, once it once it wins, it can, you know, almost all of northern Vietnam, you know, is Chinese businesses, Chinese supply chains, Chinese everything, uh, banks and so on. If, you know, in the past, if it's if it's just open, um, you know, anybody can move in. Um, and of course, you've got these two rising powers fighting over that territory. But you can only imagine that once, you know, if the United States wanted to retake um, the Vietnamese economy and, and, and sort of make it more hospitable to U.S. companies and influence, uh, not just on the corporate side, but on the academic side. And, you know, all those interlinked organizations that I was talking about earlier that make up a society, obviously, it's going to be a lot more than, you know, the, the than one dollar to get in there. Right? It's going to be it could be millions and at, at this point, billions. Um, it's not only that you might have to bribe people. It's not only that you might have to, you know, fit, promise infrastructure loans. A form of bribery, by the way, when you go into some place and say, "Well, China offered me, you know, hundred million dollars at at one percent interest to build, you know, update my infrastructure and build a new uh, train system. What are you What are you going to do for me if you want, you know, your your comp companies to come in? Uh, and then the United States Infrastructure Bank or the Export Import Banking System has to come in and say, "All right," or the IMF um, comes in and says, "Well, we'll offer you even more money." And it goes back and forth, and it's really unclear. You know why we're sort of fighting over this space in a way that puts all nations and their citizens in debt but i want to go back to what i said earlier which is that the future belongs to asia and africa because they have the populations um there's and, and particularly it's it's not going to belong to the united states because post 9 11 the united states the history of the united states has, has drastically changed from becoming a a fighter of freedom a you know a country that backs religion uh, into a country that is actually, in many cases, hostile uh, to minority religious groups, um, especially Muslims. And that's a problem because India, which is going to be the United States, you know, in the near future, uh, strongest ally in the Asian region, it has 100 plus, 100 million plus Muslims. Indonesia, which is going to be, has always been, you know, whether it's been with the Dutch having their banking system coming in and their investment coming in, um, whether it's been with the U.S. trying to stamp out communism in that, you know, region. Um, Indonesia has, you know, obviously quite a few people, mostly Muslim, outside of, well, even in Medan or you know, Sumatera, Sumatra, if you buy Starbucks beans, that's an, an, an Indonesian island. You know, so you've got a huge problem with trying to convince the people in these government and the governments to you know, to sort of favor you over China. Um, and it's not just, you know, India, it's not just Indonesia, you've got Pakistan, you've got this history that goes back to, you know, Russia accepting um, a lot of Pakistani immigrants and trying to build up that relationship. So the history of the world has been, unfortunately, a history that, that involves, you know, anti-colonial activity, especially in China with the Boxer Rebellion and the Opium Wars. And we're starting to move away from that with Russia, of course. Um, you've got so many different sort of scenarios um, with labor and the capital and so on. And it looks like for the first time, we're starting to draw lines around these, you know, these elephants in the room, these tigers fighting each other, trying to get to that open space for the first time. And so perhaps we can reach a level where we can do economic deals based on what's best for everybody uh, and try to move away from debt. And this sort of so-called virtuous cycle of debt where, you know, we buy oil from Saudi Arabia, uh, they they take some of that money, a lot of it actually, and put it into our bonds, into our treasuries. And then that allows us to essentially get some of that money back. 
and then have a multiplier effect, you know, where we get something we need, we can export it, um, and then we can continue to justify military spending. Um, and, you know, we have a multiplier effect. It doesn't, that, that's, some, that's something the Soviet Union didn't figure out. It just thought if we build infrastructure, that's all we need. We have the oil. We're not, we don't need to worry about a banking system. But as we move, move forward, you know, it, it's, it's, it dawns on me that it's not, it's easy to set up a bad bank. Uh, loaning money is not a problem. Bailing out banks is not a problem either, um, for the most part. It's something that's been done here, whether it's LTCM, whether it's, you know, the SNL crisis. Um, you know, these are just numbers on a page and at the end of the day. Um, but, you know, it's really hard to set up a, a good banking system because you have to have a lot of data. You have to link that with your insurance company system. Um, and a lot of these countries, if you go to the Philippines, they don't even have something like a FICO score. And when people talk about, say, a Chinese social credit score, a lot of that is sort of a combination of FICO and some other things. Uh, so it's not quite as totalitarian as it sounds, but clearly when you look at the populations in prison per capita in the whole world, it, it's once again, you've got China, Russia, and, 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 the, and the U.S. Uh, and I think even if you look at, that's the adult population uh, for the highest incarceration rates. I think even if you look at the youth population, uh, I know the United States is, is definitely in the top three. Um, and so you're looking at a whole system post-World War II that was supposed to have freedom, was supposed to have you know, more liberty that somehow has ended up with more segregation um, and, and you know, a lot of debt. And this isn't something that's new. If you are a Christian, you know about the Jubilees, the wiping out of debt. Um, historically, you know about, but that's not really a religious issue. That's really a human nature issue, which is why the banking systems in each country are, are so vital in terms of investment. Um, and, and ultimately, of course, if you, if you combine that with natural resources, you can end up in, an SLA, in, in a Texas-style SNL crisis, um, or you can try to have a new society that's based on something that's, that's based on integrity, which is what you know the Muslims try to come up with uh, in terms of trying to link, trying to avoid interest and usury, and you know trying to ban that, and, and instead saying that if you want to invest, you, you have to be a partner, uh, an investor. You can't just charge interest. In fact, it's, it's verboten. So every single system of, of, of philosophy has tried to fix the mistakes of the past. Um, so the Muslims look at, look at Jubilee, they look at excessive debt, they come up with a different system. But over time, because you have all these different countries of people and, and governments trying to compete with each other, the lessons are all lost. And now what you see in terms of having these geographic, you know, invisible uh, barriers to competition in the form of tariffs and in the form of informal agreements where, you know, a company like Uber says, sells off its stake in a competing uh, rideshare company called Grab in Southeast Asia and vice versa, and they both agree not to compete in each other's territories. That's happening on the corporate level, and often what happens on the corporate level is reflected in, the, in what's happening on the government level. You know, when the government spends money, it has to get that money back, which is not just through taxation, but through, well, of course, through taxation, but also fees and economic growth uh, that justifies increasing spending. Um, and so all these things are linked together. And so when I say the future belongs to these new countries, the Africa and the Asians, part of it is just because of the terrible reputation that, you know, that the United States has allowed itself to have. Uh, and in, in, in response to, you know, its, its invasion of Iraq and in response to its, its, its Guantanamo Bay, Abu Ghraib, you know, it's decided to criticize you know, China's involvement in uh, with its, um, I think it's called the Xinjiang, uh, Xinjiang province with the Uyghurs, a minority Turkish type sect, um, you know, of Muslims. And so that's, that's certainly whatever, I don't, I'm not an expert on what's going on there. China's actions on Tibet in the past indicate that it doesn't always act in good faith, um, you know, with minorities, religious minorities. But when you look at all these systems coming together uh, with intelligence operations, deliberately trying to infiltrate any way they can through nonprofits, through religious entities, through corporations, through banks, through infrastructure banks, uh, through bribery, and so on. It's all designed to spread influence. And what I see and what feel right now is that, you know, a lot of people that have been colonized in the past or are subjected to outside interference, you know, they're not, it's not that they necessarily are, are overly suspicious um, of further interference. But I think that everyone realizes that countries, all of the countries, all the major ones, don't have the wherewithal to go in debt 
at a time when, say, half the population of the amount of Americans um, are essentially poor in terms of having savings. Um, half. Uh, you can look up the what you know what the situation is, which is not surprising uh, if you look at the segregation model of of an of a housing inflation that's happened uh, deliberately so uh, with redlining and a lot of other things. Um, but I think that we have I've got the sense that, that perhaps the future can be different, and so on, and part of that is simply because we can't fail as we can't continue to fail and still survive, um, and we certainly have failed so much. You know, for the last 20 plus years. And so I can think right now, if I were Asian or I were an Asian politician or an African politician, I would simply say that the future belongs to us, uh, not only because we of our large populations, but because we have been, our our history as, as a victim of, colon, uh, of colonization has forced upon us diversity, not just racial, not just ethnic, not just religious, uh, but also linguistic. And this gives us a massive advantage over a lot of these so-called, you know, superior political systems that have resulted in an extremely high jail population as well as extremely extreme segregation, and so we in Asia, we in Africa, we have a young population that is optimistic that maybe doesn't remember its own history, but because it does not remember its own history, um, you know, it has a better chance of creating something new and better from scratch, and we in Asia and we in Indonesia. And we in Africa, whether it's in Senegal, Cameroon, uh, Nigeria, we are tired of the old ways of division. We know because we have learned that the old ways of the so-called superpowers do not work. And if they did work, we would not be in a position where, you know, these superpowers are unable or having to agree um, or negotiate geographical barriers against us. Um, in, in, in trying to carve up the world as they did post-World War I and as they did post-World War II. We, have, we see that the interest of these superpowers have, has been to sort of take away our natural resources, and that, is, and that is something that we will no longer accept. But since we know the strategy, we, too, can build upon that. We can learn from their banking mistakes. We can learn from their insurance mistakes. And we can learn because we are young and we do not, we do not have such a long memory and so many vested interests. And of course, we know we have a history of corruption, except for Singapore. Uh, and so our true aim in the future will be attempting to figure out a new path forward, uh, a new path where we shrug off the shackles of Islamophobia in the United States. We shrug off the shackles of, you know, of, of an excessive jail system, of a police state, and we try to embrace difference. And of course, we don't have a choice because we are different. And because of, you know, because of that history, because of our so many foreign powers have decided to come, out, come into our countries, have found us to be so beautiful. It is for the first time, for the first time, we want to see ourselves as deserving of a future that is independent. And we, in these countries, have oil, we have natural resources, we have timber. We have a large consumer population. And we need to look forward and try to figure out how to maintain currency strength. And the easiest way to do that, as we figured out, is to trade in the currency of one of our neighbors, because our neighbors do not, we want peace far more than somebody who is far away wants peace. If we decide, say in Asia, to adopt the Singaporean dollar, we understand that in some ways we are still linked to the US economy, uh, but at the same time, we can hedge our bets um, and decide to have a lot of you know different deals and deals in the Japanese yen. But as long as it is something that is based on the currency of our neighbors, it is easier easier to pay off the debt. Not only because shipping costs and therefore and insurance costs will be lower given the, the 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 ease of transport, but also because each neighboring region has a history. It is often a terrible history, a history of death and destruction, of war. But at the end of the day, we are neighbors. And if we can shift, first of all, our currency risk into a more manageable system by trading in, in ways that prioritizes, you know, um, our, our economic system, the stability of our economic system by linking it to close by neighbors as opposed to far away um, economic actors, regardless of their strength, we can, for the first time, try to avoid, say, Malaysian devaluation situation. We can avoid trying to fight in the WTO 
uh, about currency manipulation and let the superpowers figure that out with their massive banking systems. And that leads us to the second issue, which is how to create a banking system that is honest. And we believe that there are easier ways of doing it than the Western powers uh, or the Eastern powers. And, and one of the ways, of course, is partnerships is something, you know, called, say, an ESOP, you know, employee stock ownership, where, you know, we align the interests of the shareholders and the owners together. And, and we try to create an ownership stake, not just in, say, real estate, which is what the Western system is based on, inflation and real estate, in order to lock down that capital and then use it in other ways. We can then take that, that model and create an honest banking system insofar as it grants in each business, whether it's a nation of shopkeepers, as the UK was once you know, called, um, or, or whether it is a nation of, of you know, uh, of technology, uh, of technological prowess, if every employee has an ownership stake in their business and their work through ownership, and that and that employee has a connection to their local bank, we can, and and that bank has a has a connection to a national bank, and that national bank has a connection to its neighbor, its neighbor's currency. Then, we, as a region in economic cooperation can we realize a future where things are a little bit easier, that we're not constantly caught in between the great superpowers of the past and even the future, that we can determine our own destiny by minimizing currency fluctuations and by learning from the mistakes of the past. And we can do this because we are diverse by nature. Our history has forced diversity upon us and we can now move forward and avoid the mistakes that have happened in the United States, especially. And we no longer have to look for moral credibility anywhere else. The West has lost it with their recent elections and their infighting and, and their inability to get things done for not just in 2016, but for the last 20 years. And we can move forward because we have to. There is no other choice. If we do not move forward to create a new path, it, there is no telling what will happen, but the technology is there, uh, especially with respect to infrastructure. And we, in our developing countries in Africa, so-called developing countries in Africa and Asia, we are that open space that nobody can conquer, that can no longer be conquered by war, and that must be conquered through cooperation in economic statecraft. And so we, the older generation, will take care of the younger generation and try to teach them the lessons of the past so that these mistakes will not be made in the future with regard to banking systems being out of control, with regard to excessive um, you know, natural resource exploration, with regard to... Those would be the two major lessons. But ultimately, by allowing people on the ground level to have an ownership stake, we can align the interests of the banking sector along with the government and along with the people. And by having our currency aligned with our neighbors, we can all have a stake in regional cooperation and therefore regional stability. Because no neighbor, each neighbor wants to be a little bit, a little bit, at least a little bit better than their neighbor, but not, you know, but not so much. Because everyone realizes that such a scenario results in greater instability. And at the end of the day, it is true, there are some countries that are extremely advanced, but they do not have the population advantage that are we in Africa and in most of Asia, such as Indonesia, uh, such as Vietnam, we have in our youthful population. And this is what will allow us to be optimistic. That the young are by definition diverse. They are not hostage to the foreign interference of the past or the slave economies of the past. And so once we handle these banking and currency and shipment scenarios, we can also work on linguistic issues. The word ama means something quite different in the Old Testament um, than it does in, a, say, Singapore or Malaysia, where it means grandmother. And the next step in fostering this regional cooperation is to try to figure out a system where someone in Japan can text somebody in Malaysia and somebody in Malaysia can text somebody in Indonesia and have a seamless communication scenario. If we can do that first and prioritize that we can also avoid a lot of other scenarios where we allow an elitist class of people, whether it's lawyers, whether it's bankers, from dictating our futures.
So within these three ways of moving forward, currency, stability, and then linguistics and banking stability, we can determine our future and we can, we can determine who will be able to come in and be partners with us as opposed to slave owners, as opposed to extractors. Because that has been our history in the past and it is a history that will not be repeated and should not be repeated. In America and North America and in Europe, they are rehashing the old because they lack the creativity for the future. Their optimism is surface-based because they know they have created a society that is unjust, not just for the last 20 years, but since Vietnam. These powers have been fighting and the war has never stopped since World War II. It extended into Vietnam and it, and it continued to extend into an unjust system of economics that was based on oil and fracturing relationships between neighbors worldwide, whether it's Saudi Arabia and Iran, uh, whether it's Qatar, whether it's Turkey uh, and NATO and now shifting towards Russia. The future cannot be the superpowers dividing and conquering any longer. We know and we will learn from history and hopefully our youth, we will be able to build a future that so that our youth do not make the same mistakes as we, the old, older generation, as we, the elitist politicians have made because we do not want another revolution. We do not want more civil wars. We do not want hasty campaigns against communism that really result in opening the way for foreign powers to inject capital and banking systems from afar. We will do what we have done in the past, which is focus on our neighbors, focus on ownership, and in doing so, pave the way for a more stable future. That's a speech I would make. Let's hope other people make it too.